Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us here, uh, however remotely, however at whatever distance you are. I hope everyone's doing well. Um, uh, before going into the talk on, on the relationship, um, uh, potential and otherwise between the New Deal and the Green New Deal, uh, I uh, wanted to just show you in, uh, and make available to you um, some uh, resources that we've been developing at the Buell Center that, that uh, may help um, get oriented in, uh, in the midst of, of the crisis in, as it relates to uh, what, we're going to talk, what we're going to discuss. So this is the Power website on the, at the Buell Center. I'm going to, here, this is the, uh, the homepage of that website, power.buellcenter.columbia.edu. Um, and in which you say right here at the top, it's also listed under initiatives over here, uh, a project called Green Stimulus and Beyond, a resource. And, uh, and this is a essentially live resource that we've been updating daily uh, of material uh, that has been published mostly online. You see there are some videos here uh, on the side um, <clears throat> related to this intersection, the intersection of the, the climate crisis mostly, but not, not all of these deal with that, but, uh, and also, uh, and the, uh, the economic uh, crisis related to, uh, to the, uh, the current health crisis. So, so it's, it's an attempt to, for, for, for all of you to, to offer a kind of map, you could say a kind of cognitive map of useful material uh, that goes all the way back to early March. And as I said, is being updated every day uh, that is um, being um, published. Uh, there are also some podcasts here, uh, published by uh, various journalists and, and academics and others uh, who are thinking about these, uh, these matters, um, including uh, some of the protagonists in the New De Green New Deal discussion. Uh, also, uh, on, on the GSAP website, accessible through, also through the Buell website, now is, is this uh, page, uh, which documents the work done uh, under Public Works for a Green New Deal, the, the nine courses that were supported by the Buell Center in the fall of 2019, that seems like a previous century, um, <clears throat> uh, to, uh, to test, to experiment with, to critique even the premises of uh, the Green New Deal as, as expressed in the House resolution that I'll be discussing. So. Um, so here is, uh, are some videos of faculty uh, and students uh, and others uh, talking about the work, uh, and then um, some uh, samples of, of the work itself. So uh, you can scroll down and, and also circulate this, please, uh, to any of your friends and colleagues who might be interested, uh, whether here or elsewhere, uh, on uh, about what, what, what we've been doing here to think uh, about um, about the uh, Green New Deal more broadly, and then here uh, some links to other uh, um, activities, uh, including the uh, uh, a big uh, discussion um, at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, and um, uh, and uh, a big uh, meeting that the Public Assembly, that Buell Center co-hosted with the Queens Museum in uh, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's district and with the, her participation and that of others uh, uh, on the Green New Deal to, to try to model uh, a kind of critical um, uh, grassroots um, uh, conversation, a democratic conversation and debate uh, about, uh, about priorities and possibilities. So uh, now we'll now to the lecture. Um, so from New Deal to Green New Deal, uh, and, uh, and I did want to say that this is in memory of Michael Sorkin, uh, our colleague at City College who passed away uh, quite recently from uh, this uh, awful disease. Today, uh, in a tragic era of fast moving pandemic and slow moving climate change, what is the use of thinking historically? Why still insist, in other words, 
on teaching history to students of architecture. Well, as recent events remind us, there's one certainty that remains within the historian's purview. Uh, the simple difficult truth that things change and the simple equally difficult truth that within certain limitations, things can be made to change. How? That, uh, as I'll explain, is the point of the Green New Deal, which proposes democratic decarbonization for all rather than green gated communities, that is green lifeboats for a few. It's also the point of recent calls for a green stimulus. These are very recent. Um, that propose massive federal support for care work, such as the, the work that is being done by nurses and other medical professionals, doctors and nurses, uh, caring for uh, the, the patients who have been afflicted by, uh, by this and many other diseases, um, and other green jobs, uh, as they're sometimes called, along with, these are low carbon jobs, along with so-called shovel-ready green infrastructure projects. Such calls are inspired in part by New Deal fiscal stimulus measures. Federal jobs programs, that is, as a sustainable form of economic relief and recovery, and simultaneously a crucial step towards confronting the climate catastrophe in a decisive, equitable manner. So to reflect on what we might call the uses and disadvantages of history for the present, I'm going to first show you some architectural, infrastructural, uh, in architectural and infrastructural excerpts from the New Deal, the historical New Deal. Then I'll say a few words about the, the concurrent Green New Deal, the proposal for that. And then we'll return briefly to the New Deal historically in order to translate its contradictions uh, into strategies for our collective future. So first, the New Deal. What, what was the New Deal? The New Deal was actually many things at once a heterogeneous suite of legislation and executive actions put in place in, in the United States under the presidency of Franklin Roosevelt, uh, principally from 1933 to 1936, during the Great Depression, that is, so, so quite relevant uh, for many reasons uh, for us today. From the start, critics denounced the initiative as an unde undemocratic form of centralized planning that presumptuously interfered in so-called free markets, or from a different perspective, uh, subordinated the needs and voices of affected communities uh, to the ideological priorities of governing elites and technocrats. The, the New Deal has been, was criticized from the beginning and still is from these and many other perspectives. Nonetheless, here we're here to recognize its uh, contributions as well as, to, as, well as its um, limitations. The, now the centerpiece of the New Deal's first phase from 1933 to 1935 was the National Industrial Recovery Act, which protected labor unions, established a body to oversee uh, public works, a great deal of public works, and set price controls and production quotas for industry. More radically, the New Deal's second phase, 1935 to 36 roughly, <clears throat> saw passage of the National Labor Relations Act, the Public Utility Holdings, Holding Company Act and the Social Security Act, among uh, many others, uh, all of which are designed to regulate capital and redistribute material and social goods. Today, as, as we speak, literally as we speak, under emergency conditions, these and other need New Deal programs are being cited by many as evidence of government's ability to address societal crisis and provide economic support in the form of jobs and social programs. Now among this alphabet soup, as it's sometimes called, of New Deal agency acronyms, the Public Works Administration, or PWA, and later the Works Progress Administration, WPA, uh, funded and oversaw the construction of public infrastructure and buildings on a scale uh, never before seen in the United States. The PWA did so indirectly through grants and loans um, uh, while the WPA did so through direct employment. Typical PWA and WPA projects were designed by architects and engineers, typically, uh, working anonymously uh, for public agencies, not, not in, uh, in their own offices. So in other words, working anonymously for public agencies rather than by celebrities in private practice. This is a big difference from the way that we typically see architectural practice today. Thus, uh, at the time, already replacing the modernist cult of genius with a more democratic form of collaborative work while providing much needed employment 
uh, for design professionals as well as for construction workers and many others. So here are just a few examples of New Deal projects from New York City. One right in our neighborhood here uh, near Columbia, Riverside Park, uh, which was originally designed by Frederick Law Olmsted in the late 19th century, the sort of first phase by Riverside Drive, um, <clears throat> but, built, uh, but was built out over the rail line. This is the promenade area in the park um, by 4,000 workers from the WPA uh, to designs by Gilmore Clark, Michael Rapuano and Clinton Lloyd under New York City, then New York City Parks Commissioner Robert Moses from 1934 to 1937. Uh, the Harlem River Houses, completed in 1937, was among the very first federal, federally funded public housing projects in New York City or anywhere in the country, designed by a team, led, a team of eight architects led by Archibald Manning Brown, working with the New York City Housing Authority. The, the, again, pertinent for our times, the Rose Bank Quarantine Center on Staten Island, which had been used as a quarantine hospital for immigrants since 1873 and was expanded in 1935 by a K construction company with New Deal funding overseen by the US Treasury. And here, uh, in tribute to medical workers now fighting the pandemic in this, in this building, uh, there's also Bellevue Hospital, New York City's first public hospital. Uh, through the 1930s, the PWA designed and built or sponsored and built uh, several uh, public buildings, several new buildings uh, for the Bellevue complex and made additions, uh, additions to several others. Uh, and school buildings uh, like the Franklin K. Lane High School in Brooklyn, New York, which was uh, among roughly 2000 schools uh, built or renovated during the New Deal and was designed uh, by a team led by uh, Walter C. Martin uh, and completed for the PWA in 1938. Now, alongside uh, civic buildings and, uh, and spaces like these, the WPA employed 8.5 million workers uh, to build thousands of other less visible projects, basically infrastructure projects, uh, including hundreds of local bridges and airports, thousands of water supply uh, systems and, uh, and sewer lines. Uh, here's one in Buffalo, the reservoir in Buffalo hundreds of thousands of miles of roads, and so on. Um, the PWA added loans and grants to state and, local, and city governments to build infrastructure like, uh, again, here in New York, the Triborough Bridge, now the RFK Bridge, uh, the Grand Coulee Dam in Washington, and the Washington National, or now Reagan Airport in DC. Uh, all, uh, all while the Civilian Conservation Corps, uh, or the CCC, uh, planted three billion trees uh, uh, all across the country. Lots of trees. Okay. But now I, I want to consider in a little more detail another New Deal initiative, uh, maybe something uh, that many of you heard of, um, the Tennessee Valley Authority or TVA. Established in 1933, the TVA created thousands of construction jobs and provided publicly subsidized electricity to hundreds of thousands of households via a comprehensive infrastructural transformation of the 40,000 40, square mile Tennessee River Valley that was overseen by uh, a, new, a new federal body, the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, a bit like kind of the Port Authority or something like that, uh, the TVA. It, all it also, however, uh, this project, a program also rep re reproduced injustices from which any effort to revive New Deal era policies must learn. So we're going to recognize uh, the potential to, to, to learn from uh, this project in two ways. One, in terms of its many achievements in, in uh, supporting jobs and providing electricity, uh, and, and, uh, and, but also in, in reproducing uh, injustice. Now, initial, initially proposed as a means to improve navigation, to control flooding and repair def deforestation in an area the size of England while providing well-paid construction jobs to an impoverished rural population. By 1940, the TVA included 11 dams with a generating capacity of about 1.4 million kilowatts. When completed in 1954, the TVA system, because you can see here even from the map, it's a system, it's a regional system, total 32 dams of both the high head storage type, like the Norris Dam, 
uh, and the low had uh, navigational types, uh, 26 of which were build, built or owned by the authority itself. The high head types were usually built on tributaries. The low head types, which yielded the greatest electrical output, were built on the main river. So like this one, the first no, low head uh, installation built by the authority was Wheeler Dam, about midway between Florence and Decatur, Alabama. Conceived as civic monuments by a design team led by Harry B. Tour, Roland Vonk, and Mario Bianculli, uh, the, the TVA dams invited a voting public to witness firsthand a spectacle, uh, they could go and see these, these, these places, these rooms, a spectacle of raw concrete, rushing water, and spinning turbines. Visitors to Wheeler were welcomed uh, in an elegant reception room. This is the reception room for Wheeler Dam. Uh, which introduced them to the TVA's grandeur with gridded, dis gridded displays of maps, photograph, photographs, and streamlined slogans describing the sort of overall TVA program. Uh, just beyond, behind the exhibition, through that door that you see there, um, however, separate restrooms of matter-of-factly divided black citizens from white. The conflict to which these restrooms uh, testified, and here you see them in plan, you can count four restrooms here rather than two, uh, was memorialized even more grimly uh, in a detail of quote unquote typical drinking fountains uh, used throughout the TVA as reproduced here for architects in a 1939 issue of Pencil, Pencil Points. An unadorned marble bowl sits discreetly in a gridded niche lined with glazed tile and, and illuminated with a re recessed fixture. Above, sans serif uh, chrome letters, you see them here, serenely admonish, white. <clears throat> so this is in a sense the, the silent, not so the tragedy of, uh, of the TV. As the political scientist, and now uh, I should say acting Columbia provost, Ira Katznelson has shown progressive New Dealers, including Roosevelt, repeatedly made concessions to Southern Democrats that preserved racial discrimination in order to secure their votes in Congress. These are there because of the politics of, of getting the legislation through. Referring to coal mining, uh, here is a map, for example, of the Kentucky coal fields, in, in which you see here in dark green. <clears throat> Roosevelt insisted in 1934 that, quote, it is not the purpose of the administration by sudden or explosive change to impair Southern industry by refusing to recognize what he called traditional differentials. Now, these traditional differentials were, of course, racial and economic. They were also cross-hatched with gender. Just as the NRA did little to, uh, the, the, um, uh, the earlier New Deal legislation did little to protect African-American agricultural workers in the South, um, by it, it built in lower wages for predominantly white coal miners south of the Ohio, Ohio River than for those further north. So there were various degrees of discrimination, um, some along racial lines, some along regional lines. This again is an important context in which we should understand the Green New Deal, uh, which places a strong uh, and uncompromising emphasis on racial and economic justice as inseparable from environmental justice. So, okay, but what exactly is the Green New Deal? Uh, it is, as you may know, a proposal rather than a piece of legislation or a program. Introduced on February uh, 7th, uh, 2019, uh, and uh, co-authored by uh, uh, New York Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, along with, as you see here, many others, um, U.S. House of Representatives Resolution 109, or H HR 109, quote, recognizing the duty of the federal government to create a Green New Deal and its Senate companion, S-59, have become an important focus for the nationwide and now indeed international campaign for climate justice. Uh, the resolution centerpiece is a call to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions through a fair and just transition for all communities 
and workers. That's a quote from the text. It's 14 page text, which is available online. You can download it uh, if you want. It defines the climate crisis as a social crisis. In high legislative prose, the whereas and the results and so on, um, the, uh, uh, the, um, in the resolution, observation leads to action as the text moves uh, from uh, whereas to resolved. For example, quote, whereas, here, I'll just give you some quotes and you'll see how, how it moves from observation to resolution. Whereas the United States is currently experiencing several related crises with the greatest uh, income inequality since the 1920s. And now, of course, this has been exacerbated by the current uh, crisis. Um, a large racial wealth divide amounting to a difference of 20 times more wealth between the average white family and the average black family. And a gender er earnings gap that results in women earning approximately 80% as much as men at the medium. This is all from the Green New Deal uh, resolution. And then whereas, Climate change, pollution, and environmental destruction have exacerbated systemic, racial, regional, and social, environmental, and, uh, <clears throat> and economic injustices, uh, referred to in this preamble as systemic injustices, by disproportionately affecting indigenous peoples, communities of color, migrant communities, deindustrialized communities, depopulated rural communities, the poor, low-income workers, women, the elderly, the unhoused, people with disabilities, and youth uh, referred to in this preamble as frontline and vulnerable communities. This is language that you'll, you'll hear uh, regularly in climate justice uh, discussions. And then resolved that, it, that is, it is the sense of the House of Representatives, they're proposing that this be adopted, um, that one, it's the duty of the federal government to create a Green New Deal. Um, to, uh, among other things, to, as you see here, achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions, but also to, pr to promote justice and equity by stopping uh, current, uh, preventing future and repairing historic oppression to indigenous peoples, communities of color, migrant communities, deindustrialized communities, depopulated rural communities, poor, low-income workers, women, the elderly, the unhoused, people with disabilities, and youth. Again, frontline and vulnerable communities. So in its very name, then, in, in a sense, echoing the, the, the term, the name New Deal, the Green New Deal, or sometimes the GND, points to what historians sometimes call a usable past, parts of which I've, I've just shown you from the New Deal. Climate change, uh, but not all of this, obviously, is, is usable. Uh, this is the point, is how to, to, to think uh, and, and to develop on, build on the positive and, and affirmative dimensions of examples like the New Deal, while uh, critically uh, uh, refusing um, their, um, uh, the oppressions that, as I showed you, uh, they nonetheless reproduce. Uh, so, okay, so all of this, so, so, so the Green New Deal sort of citing or quoting from the New Deal uh, points backwards. It, it sort of pulls something from the past into the present and, and asks us uh, to build upon it. Climate change, on the other hand, looks forward into the future. Now, given the contribution, uh, the contradictions, uh, sorry, that plagued the original New Deal, as I pointed out, sy systematic racial discrimination, uh, as well as indiscriminate erasure uh, in the TVA of impover impoverished rural communities, even as in other areas, uh, similar communities were being um, supported. It's notable that the Green New Deal resolution calls unambiguously for, quote, the use of democratic and participatory processes that are inclusive of and led by frontline and vulnerable communities and workers uh, to implement the required social, economic, and technological changes. But beyond the meaningful participation of disenfranchised groups in decision-making, so, you know, what may, might a properly democratic Green New Deal look like? Um, all right, well, to explore this question, we can return uh, again quickly to the social and spatial paradigm on which the TVA was based, uh, that is regionalism. Now, the TVA rearranged the technical, uh, so I'm again returning to the TVA as a sort of example of an infrastructural, large scale infrastructural and potentially green uh, jobs program basically 
um, that, uh, that offers some lessons uh, to us in the present um, to think through um, the, both the contradictions, as I said, and the, and the potential for this kind of policy and this kind of, um, these kinds of programs. So the TVA rearranged the technological, natural, and political geography uh, of the Tennessee Valley through regional planning. Influentially advocated by the Regional Planning Association of America, the RPA, uh, this approach was exemplified uh, by a 1926 study you see here at the top by Henry Wright and Benton Mackay uh, for the reorganization of New York State around a proposed hydroelectric corridor. This scheme, this project wasn't realized, but, it, but this kind of thinking informed the TVA. And despite its other purposes, flood control, reforestation, agricultural development, it was the TVA's ability to generate large quantities of hydropower and distribute electricity at rates that undercut local monopolies that gave it unprecedented scope in reorganizing the political economy of the Tennessee Valley. Originating near Knoxville uh, with tributaries, you see, okay, Knoxville is over here, here. Uh, with tributaries um, reaching into Virginia and North Carolina, the Tennessee River follows a southwestern course into Alabama, glances along, the, uh, along Mississippi's northeastern corner, and returns north into western Tennessee and through Kentucky, where it meets uh, the o Ohio River uh, at Paducah. So you can see the, the tributaries coming in here. They're all, uh, this is now the Tennessee uh, River, and, and it's going up here and it meets the Ohio River up here. The Ohio, the Ohio uh, discharges in turn into the Mississippi River at Cairo, Illinois, um, and, and from there the Mississippi flows south. So um, about halfway along the Tennessee River's 1200 uh, uh, mile length uh, at Muscle Shoals, uh, Alabama, we uh, uh, is the Wilson, uh, the Wilson Dam. So you see the Wilson Dam here. Um, <clears throat> begun at the close of the First World War in 1918, the Wilson Dam was intended as a source of hydroelectric electric power for the manufacture of, um, of ammonium nitrate used in munitions. After its completion in 1924, Henry Ford sought but failed, Henry Ford of Ford Motor Company, had sought but failed to acquire the dam and two adjacent nitrate plants from the federal government to manufacture fertilizer for southern cotton. In the early 1930s, following in Ford's footsteps, the TVA's managers converted the two Muscle Shoals nitrate plants into facilities for the energy intensive production of phosphate based fertilizers to be distributed at no cost to local farmers. Historically, geographically, and technologically, then, Muscle Shoals was the epicenter of the whole sort of TVA system. So this dam was sort of at the center of it. Technically, uh, the Tennessee Valley is not exactly a region. Um, Howard W. Odom, the South's most prominent academic regionalist, here's his book, um, referred to it as a subregion. Odom divine, defined the Tennessee Valley by a circle radiating 400 miles from Muscle Shoals. So if you go 400 miles around Muscle Shoals, you get the Tennessee Valley, which contained in microcosm what he called quote, all the elemental factors of the new American regionalism and a fair epitome of the range and complexity of the Southern regions. This is a very specific idea about regionalism. I know the term is used in many different ways in architecture and urbanism. There's a particular idea about regionalism that is used technologically, um, geographically, uh, uh, but also politically. So here um, you see, for example, uh, Odom showing the subregion of the Tennessee Valley right here, over here on the, on the right. Um, <clears throat> overlaid with a network, uh, with a network of interstate highways. Uh, he, working at the University of North Carolina, Odom studied the particularities of what he called regional folkways, uh, the, 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 the life uh, ways of, of the, the people who live uh, in, the, in, in this region as an alternative. So we basically did sociological work and quasi-ethnographic work as an alternative 
uh, to the paradigm to, to try to develop understandings of ways of life in these different areas as an alternative to the paradigm, then the then dominant paradigm of competing geographic areas, competing cultures, and competing economies, predominantly the North and the South, that was known as sectionalism. So Odom's larger project, uh, the larger project of this kind of regionalism, was to redraw the nation's internal boundaries in a manner that replaced a formerly monolithic idea of the South with what he called a composite picture based on hundreds of tabulated ind indexes measuring distinct geographic, cultural, natural, and technological characteristics. It was basically a big data project. That's basically what this kind of regionalism was. I mean, hundreds of tables and charts and so on. Differentiating the colonial Southeast from the newly developing Southwest, this is the 1930s, um, Odom divided the country into six loosely bounded regions. Uh, that were integrated into what amounted, from his point of view, uh, to a national ecosystem. So here you see the regions, the Northeast, Southeast, Middle States, Northwest, Southwest, and then Far West. And, and then here's the sort of sense of the ecosystem uh, into which these were integrated. So the basic idea is that where sectionalism, the kind of North-South uh, antagonism that, that uh, dates from, of course, prior to the Civil War, where sectionalism divided, regionalism united. It linked distinct regions and, and, and social worlds uh, and ecological worlds together. Nevertheless, so it's conciliatory, right? It's, 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 it's a way of, of binding uh, the, the, the country together in socially uh, and, and geographically. Nevertheless, a thread of conflict uh, runs through this regionalism, a, a kind of separatism, we could say, which paints a picture of a Southern people divided by race. The geographical center of the Southeast, the, the region here, right, the Southeast down here, in which the Tennessee Valley was located, um, was the, the geographical center of this was the, what was known as the Black Belt, um, which ran through the heart uh, of what was, had, was long known as the Cotton Kingdom. You see this here, the Cotton Southeast. Uh, which was, was, had been since the uh, uh, 18th century, really, and throughout the 19th century, a key supplier uh, to the global textile industry uh, and a site for the reproduction of global capital. Recognizing the injustice of white supremacy, but deferring to regionalism's conciliatory evolutionist view, Odom, our regionalist, uh, appealed to the long term. So this is a quote from Odom from this kind of discourse on regionalism uh, from the time. Manifestly, he says, quote, it's asking too much of a region to change overnight the powerful folkways of long generations. What did he mean by folkways? What does a term like folkways mean here? Well, basically folkways stands here as a euphemism for racial discrimination. So basically he's saying, don't ask the South, the Southern people, the, the inhabitants of this region, or any other region to change their folkways too quickly. Uh, so this, this functions, this kind of euphemistic language functions as an apology uh, that enables the um, culturally and kind of in the background, um, the cultural kind of uh, narrative that, that, that accompanies the separate but equal, so-called separate but equal restrooms and, and water fountains that were ultimately built uh, in, the, in the TVA um, installations. Now, of the three uh, TVA's uh, three directors, David Lilienthal, Arthur Morgan, and Harcourt Morgan, no, not related to Arthur, Arthur Morgan was most committed to regional planning. Like Roosevelt, uh, Morgan, who favored more extensive government involvement in electri electricity distribution, saw the Tennessee Valley, which you see here again, shown by Odom uh, with Harry Moore as other, uh, uh, with other River Valley regions. Uh, Morgan in particular, but uh, many of these uh, TVA planners uh, saw this area as a laboratory, quote unquote laboratory, in which infrastructural development could lead to social transformation. Following what Lilienthal uh, disingenuously called a grassroots strategy, it wasn't really a grassroots strategy, but they called it that, the TVA's technocrats sought to incorporate local folkways, quote unquote folkways, into developments such as Norris, Tennessee, a model suburb in the wilderness, as they called it, uh, built for workers on the TVA's first project, the, the Norris Dam. So this is, so this is the dam, uh, and Norris Village was built for um, 
for the people working on this dam, this village. The folkways in question, as I were, were overwhelmingly those of rural whites. And despite massive displacement caused by, by flooding the river valley, the folk tradi tradition that proved most durable was the racial divide. Built as a permanent village rather than temporary, a temporary construction camp, Norris con consisted of 294 single family houses, 10 duplexes, and five 30 unit apartment buildings, all for white workers and their families. Lily white reconstruction, uh, quote unquote, as John P. Davis, a prominent African-American journalist called it. Incorporating features like screen porches, uh, the moder modest houses uh, of Norris Village were based on the rural vernacular, except that chimneys, as you can see here, were moved um, into the, uh, from the flanking walls, where they typically were in the, the older buildings, to a utility core at the center of the house uh, to accommodate the new electrical service used for heating and low cost appliances being supplied by the, the TVA system. In marked contrast then to the so-called separate but equal restrooms at visitor center, centers at the uh, TVA dams, uh, the utilitarian community center uh, at Norris included uh, one rest, only one restroom for men and one for women, uh, whites only, because it was a whites only village. The water thus flowed mightily through the TVA system. Its currents slowed for navigation and channeled for irrigation. Its energies harnessed to electrify the rural landscape. Its intimacies divided in public restrooms, public drinking fountains, and segregated housing. Today, we might temp be tempted to, co to consider this coexistence of enlightened modernity, these, these public works uh, uh, of, uh, of enlightened modernity, uh, the coexistence of enlightened modernity and genteel barbarism, uh, the racial discrimination that was built into them as anachronistic. We, we might be tempted to say, okay, that, that all, it was all back then in the past and we're beyond all of this um, and, and, and the, such mistakes will not be repeated. Now, of course, as I've said, the Green New Deal's congressional authors evoke such precedents as the New Deal to blunt capital's sharpest edges, like the racial wage discrimination and other so-called traditional different differentials that were built even into Roosevelt's origin. And they seek to blunt these edges with renewables, remediation, and green jobs. But revisiting precedents in this way takes, uh, I think, a little bit more historical care. And that's what we're here to do. That's what we're here to do uh, in the university. And that's what we're here to do uh, thinking critically with history. So finally, I just want to go uh, back to the TVA for just a few more minutes uh, before we, we speak about um, the, the, the potential strategies for the future. <clears throat> uh, so I'm going to focus now on, on the energy provision uh, aspect of, of the TVA system. Now, among the early controversies surrounding the TVA was the question of who would distribute and sell the electricity its turbines generated. For utility companies looking to profit from this new source, it was one thing for the federal government to supply them with power at wholesale rates, and quite another for the TVA to cut them out entirely by supplying electricity directly to consumers. Beginning in 1934, the TVA transmitted electricity from the Wilson Dam to households and businesses in Tupelo, uh, Tupelo Mississippi. Um, so it, it, this whole process of, of distributing electricity began already in 1934 from the dams to, to local households and businesses, in this case in Mississippi. Um, reporting in 1935, um, Davis noted that for the over, um, this is Charles, uh, this is <clears throat> sorry, John, uh, John Davis writing in, uh, in, the, uh, in the crisis, which is the, the, the principal magazine of the NAACP, um, reported that for the over 11,000 African-Americans living there, um, quote, largely in grotesque rented slum dwellings that landlords uh, found unprofitable, uh, unprofitable to wire, cheap electricity meant, uh, in his words, meant nothing. So it didn't matter that there was cheap electricity for, for the uh, the African-American 
uh, families living uh, in Tupelo, Mississippi because they, their houses weren't wired uh, because it wasn't profitable for the landlords to wire those houses. So, so this is one of the ways in which electricity connects with social relations, in this case, real estate uh, and, uh, and, the, and ways of life uh, and the inequities uh, built in, or shall we say hardwired uh, into, um, into quote unquote uh, folkways. Now, despite pu public su subsidy then, as Davis put it, uh, John Davis put it, public, uh, millions of kilowatt hours will be generated, as he said, at a price so high, quote, that for Negroes, it might just as well be lightning from the sky. It might just as well be lightning from the sky. Access to this lightning and the modern mechanized life that it promised was therefore among the more measurable wages uh, or privileges of whiteness. Uh, Nevertheless, uh, so basically access to, to electricity divided along racial lines. Nevertheless, Davis argued that in addition to organizing black labor, um, his readers, quote, should demand a program of socialized, i.e. public or state-owned electrification, which will enable Negro workers to have some benefit from the power program, end quote. In other words, Davis is not rejecting the power program, the, the TVA program entirely. He's, he's saying basically, um, that his readers should demand a properly socialized public state-owned program uh, that, that would, would begin the process of democratizing uh, access to electricity. In some municipalities serviced by the TVA, electricity was distributed in, in another way, but uh, through, through, through a relatively small local collectively owned energy cooperatives that were established uh, also under the New Deal under the uh, Rural Electrification Administration, or REA. This model actually has survived and remains viable in many parts of the country, including in the Tennessee Valley Public Power Association, which is a, a non-profit group of uh, what they call consumer-owned power companies, basically local cooperatives. Still, uh, from the turbines to the family house, TVA electricity was from the start only partly public. Its generation, price, and availability were matters of partially, and as I've just explained, dramatically variable um, uh, access and democratic governance. Yet, as Davis and other critics noted, despite its contradictions, the TVA remains a potential model for subsidized, subsidized democratically ac accountable provision uh, of public electricity. Um, so in other words, uh, the, I'll say it again, the TVA remains a potential model for the subsidized, democratically uh, accountable provision of public electricity. That is public power, as, as in the logo here, but public power uh, at a regional or, or perhaps national uh, scale. Or transnational, we could even say, scale. This then uh, is one uh, history lesson for the, from the, uh, for the Green New Deal. Uh, uh, if the pattern of ec economic devastation uh, that is unfolding as we speak, initiated by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, if this continues, recovery programs much larger than those of the New Deal uh, will be required in the U.S. to say nothing of elsewhere in the world. Meanwhile, the climate clock ticks on. Prior to the pandemic, uh, the authors of the Green New Deal pointed out that racial discrimination and other forms of structural inequality affecting frontline and vulnerable communities are the very definition of the climate crisis. Right? They're not, not, not separate from it, right? They're the very definition of the climate crisis rather than some kind of unfortunate side effect. Now, as we see such inequalities playing out before our eyes through unequal access to healthcare, to paid sick leave and to many other necessities, um, we must learn to see these two crises together, pandemic uh, in the short term uh, and climate change in the longer term. Architecture can help provide uh, solutions in the form of housing, hospitals, schools, and other public institutions, as I showed you earlier, but only if, if linked up with the kinds of democratic power and the sense of both energy and political voice uh, that truly and, unapolo and un unapologetically public works can provide. In other words, uh, it's time to rethink 
with the help of architecture and urbanism and many other fields and areas of work, the institutions uh, and infrastructures that govern, govern our common world uh, and the technical, political, and social means by which they do so. Learning from the American New Deal, and, but also from many other more radical examples, while acknowledging their contradictions, architecture and urbanism can help restore meaning to the word public, um, as in public works, um, uh, as a social economic term, as well as a spatial term. So not just public space, but, but, but social uh, a kind of way of being together, a social contract uh, and economic relation. Public uh, ownership, for example, uh, of, uh, of public goods. Um, to the point where an expression like public power, as you see in the logo here, can mean not just municipal ownership, so not just public ownership, not just municipal ownership, but clean, renewable electric electricity generated and, di and distributed democratically as a collective good, a common good, uh, like water and clean air for free. Just can you imagine electricity for free to support all lives equally rather than a few unequally? To do so, the meaning of public power must be expanded to include organized collective action. Right? It's not just about, um, about uh, technical processes. Uh, public power, power must be expanded to in, incorporate, include organized collective action at the ballot box, in the streets, or uh, for, the, for the time being, and hopefully not for, for too long, uh, online, but also online. Uh, beginning with a Green New Deal uh, for all in place of lifeboats designed by very stable geniuses for the survival of just a few. Okay, thank you. So I think now we can, um, I'll stop the share and we have a few minutes for any questions. So I, you know, I know some of you have to go at, um, at, uh, at um, you know, two o'clock. But the chat, the chat's now open um, for questions. So if anybody has questions, I'm happy to answer uh, answer them, and I'll read the questions out as they um, as they come up. Questions? Some of you might have uh, made use of anybody who traveled from one of the airports, for example, uh, to New York City. Um, to come to Colombia, um, made use of at least one New Deal project that I showed you, the, the Triborough Bridge. But of course, there are many, many others, probably in parts of the country, for those of you who, who live uh, in the US, uh, where you might have um, seen similar um, uh, and, and, and benefited from similar uh, public works. So from Dylan. Um, uh, what do you consider we can leverage these lessons around public, providing public internet? Yeah, as utility during this period. That's an excellent question. Um, I, I mean, you know, okay, sorry, public, providing public internet as a utility during this period when it has become a necessity. It's a great point that, that um, of all times, now would be the time uh, for, you know, in stimulus package, let's say number four, we're on number three, you, you may realize already the $2 trillion uh, package that was approved last week was the really technically the third um, major legislation related to the pandemic. Pandem pandemic. Um, but, uh, on, uh, but it didn't, uh, uh, as far as I know, I don't think it at all really uh, addressed um, public access to the internet, which as Dylan is pointing out, uh, is critical uh, for students uh, and for workers of many kinds of many uh, uh, many types, um, especially at this time. So that would be uh, an excellent kind of parallel uh, to to the to the the kinds of basically the thinking about what 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 necessities uh, of life. Um, you know, so internet access has become a necessity. Um, collective action, which is to say in, in our current system, government action. There are other models for this, but, but 
uh, public in the sense of uh, a federal or it could be state or, local or other municipal action uh, could assist with. So yes, we could imagine in a future green stimulus, um, a kind of net neutral public uh, access, um, kind of like public television maybe, um, uh, provision uh, that would subsidize uh, internet service for those who don't have it. I know this was a big, big issue for for uh, in here in New York when uh, in closing the New York City schools, uh, many felt that that many many of the kids would not be able to learn learn online and uh, because they didn't have internet at home, uh, and that would that would reinforce the the kind of these 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 inequities that are that are um, already present. I have uh, Kadiva Tarver has raised their hand. Let me see. Um, I don't know, uh, Kariva, maybe you want to type your question. Is that okay, since we're doing it by typing rather than by, you know, sort of hand raising? Yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to. Can, can you do that if you want? Yeah. I mean, you can ask your question, then we have another question from Jackie. Okay, wait, um, I've got more questions. Kariva, why don't you ask your question, and then I have a couple more coming up. Can I, I think I can. Sounds like she might have accidentally clicked the hand raise. Reinhold, oh, okay. Go oh, ahead she didn't to mean the next to. Okay, question. sorry. Okay, there we go. Okay, fine. Okay, Jackie, Jackie Rivera. In terms of the unhoused, as the GNE calls them, how possible or viable would it be to repurpose larger buildings like armories as affordable housing options versus building new? Yeah, I mean, this is like an architect's question, you know. Of course. Um, but, but, you know, uh, the, the basic challenge in, in repurposing, for example, uh, any uh, existing building, you know, a, a building that's not very well used or, or, or underutilized for purposes of housing unhoused uh, persons or, or, or people whose housing is, is just unaffordable. Um, existing housing that's unaffordable um, has to do with ownership. I mean, basically it has to do with, with the financial uh, pressures put on such properties by real estate speculation uh, and and on the one side, in other words, that that these buildings have certain kind of market values and so on, and then on the other side, uh, the the very very um, weak political will, if at all, uh, to to do such work. I mean, in other words, the budgets that that the the unwillingness of Congress or other uh, bodies to uh, to fund uh, such efforts to, you know, because it, it would, let's say if it's in New York, the city would have to buy up an armory probably, or if it's, if they already own it, they'd have to find the money somewhere to, um, to, uh, to, uh, to build that, uh, to do that renovation. Um, now, there are two ways to get that money. One is to raise taxes, and, and you don't want to raise taxes on the people whose housing is already basically unaffordable, so it would be to raise taxes on on the upper echelons of the society, uh, you know, sometimes this this discussion goes is is conducted around one percent, ninety nine percent, and where where that is absolutely true, the disproportionate um, wealth is 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 uh, is uh, is upwardly distributed towards one uh, percent of the population. Uh, you know, there are many other ways in which we could think about taxing uh, uh, the wealthy or or um, the the uh, the upper middle classes. Um, the, but there's also, as we've just seen, from, because nobody actually asked, where does this two trillion come from that's now being spent uh, to relieve the, the certain aspects of the pandem pandemic? Uh, the government has other mechanisms to, by which to spend. It's basically deficit spending, and there are many, many debates and, and disputes about the, the value and the, the potential for that. If you want to read about it, the, the resource on the Buell Center, the green stimulus resource that I uh, showed you at the beginning, uh, has collected a number of articles um, uh, in which economists and, and political scientists and others make arguments for this kind of spending, especially in a time of crisis. So you can look at, uh, at that there. Okay, I'm going to move to, uh, but thank you. Thank you for that, that question. Uh, I wish we could have more of a discussion, but I guess we're just going to do it this way. Um, from Alan, Alan Vaughn, a lot of um, democratic participation that, hi that is highlighted in the Green New Deal is currently used by the powerful and the wealthy as a weapon for stopping serious action on climate change. Yes, this is familiar. Uh, examples include wealthy car owners, kind of nimbyism basically, uh, blocking the 14th Street busway, vacation homeowners delaying the installation of offshore wind farms that I believe 
you're referring to Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, wealthy homeowners in California delaying the electrification of Caltrain, and so on. Yes. How should we look to stop illeg illegitimate uses of democratic power and who gets to decide, decide what counts? Well, we should, you know, is a, again, a great question. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, I mean, the short answer is democratically. In other words, that, you know, these wealthy homeowners or the others who, 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 who are, 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 are blocking these initiatives from positions of privilege are, are exercising their privilege either through their political, their influence in, in local or, or national politics through, you know, either could be through direct uh, campaign contributions or many, many other channels by which elites exercise political influence uh, and, and, and therefore block actual uh, um, uh, democratic uh, decision making, uh, you know, around these kinds of questions. So, so more democracy, not less, in order to counter um, the, the kind of manipulation of, you know, town hall meetings and, and other uh, also uh, uh, various um, uh, uh, plebiscites and, 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 and votes that are some, sometimes taken uh, around particular in, uh, initiatives in different uh, parts of, uh, of, of the country. Um, the, uh, so, so, you know, what that means uh, is that the, the Green New Deal isn't just a, a, a kind of legislative proposal. The Green New Deal is, is, the, is the tip of a very, very large iceberg that is made principally of social movements, uh, of, of movements that, that have been active for many, many years. The various forms of environmental justice movements, social justice movements, economic justice movements, racial justice movements, uh, and, and so on, that that have been making these cases and making these arguments and often participating in some of the same disputes that you're, you're talking about here, these meetings that get interrupted by, uh, or, or get shut down by, by wealthy landowners. Um, that, uh, and the, this movement, this is public power, basically. It's the movements, it's the capacity of large numbers of people uh, to, to literally to vote in favor of proposals that, uh, that democratize rather than de-democratize. Uh, but also to act in a, what is sometimes called extra, extra parliamentary way to sometimes take to the streets, sometimes to lobby uh, very aggressively their, their, their local and national politicians, uh, and otherwise to speak politically. So, so this is a, it's clearly a political question as much as it is a technical uh, or, or simply sort of socio socioeconomic. Uh, okay, so to, keep, to continue uh, with what looks to be the the last question at the moment from Milo, Milo McBride. <clears throat> uh, as the New Deal era helped solidify a style of American architecture, okay, we have uh, American architecture, uh, Art Deco, mid-century modernism, and so on, uh, how do you see the role of design in working to create something analogous for the GND? How can we build a sustainable, resilient architecture in a way that creates cultural and aesthetic value? Are there specific projects that you can suggest looking towards? Well, first of all, um, yes. I mean, again, it's a great question. And, and uh, first of all, um, the, you can go back to the GSAP website and look at, I don't know, maybe you were, you put, were a participant in this, but some of you probably were. Uh, look at the student work that was done uh, under the Public Works um, for Green New Deal teaching uh, initiative um, from the Buell Center. Uh, this past uh, year and uh, in the fall, and, and you'll see some proposals from some of your own colleagues uh, for uh, architectural languages, we could say, or forms and, and aesthetic uh, values that, that accompany uh, the te technical and, um, and more policy-based uh, aspects uh, of, uh, of, of basically, excuse me, um, uh, green uh, thinking. Now, but another part of your question uh, implies uh, something else, I think, that, uh, that you asked, how can we build sustainable resilient architecture in a way that creates cultural and aesthetic value? Okay, the value here uh, can, can take other forms. It's, it, it, there's, you know, okay, it's something that we might appreciate as an artwork, but the value here might also uh, imply um, <clears throat> the capacity to tell different stories. Now I'm putting it that way, not because I think architecture necessarily tells stories, but because 
architecture does represent value. It, it's, it circulates uh, value in the form of, of, uh, of symbolic uh, language, uh, of, of experience, uh, uh, and of any other kind of poetic um, techniques uh, and dimensions that, that you, you know, those of you who design buildings, uh, talk about all the time in, in your studios and reviews and so on. Um, if you, it, it is in, the, the, in that kind of milieu, broadly the kind of cultural aesthetic domain, that, that, we, that the imagination, the collective as well as individual imagination is shaped. And really what I'm, I'm asking, and so this could be a test for any project, so I, I'm not gonna you know, offer this or that specific project as, as an answer because we don't have any silver bullets to offer uh, here, unfortunately, but, but there are many, many projects historical and contemporary that in various ways extend the imagination and allow us by showing us, by demonstrating as sort of object lessons, uh, how we might do this kind, of, uh, th this kind of thing. Sometimes these are public projects, sometimes they're, they're not, but they, 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 they stretch the envelope of, of the constraints under which architects tend to work, you know, the sort of uh, uh, under the thumb, basically, of real estate investment and so on, um, in very imaginative ways. Uh, they try to work outside various boxes, um, economic ones uh, and political ones. So, uh, you know, I'll give you one example from the political world that um, you may not know, but in relation to the GND, uh, there were two, actually, two uh, public housing initiatives. So, so it, I'd just say basically public housing would be one answer. Um, but um, two public housing, one uh, proposed by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and others, and Ed Markey, to, uh, to um, uh, adapt uh, the existing public housing stock. It's called the Green New Deal for Public Housing. You can look, at it, look for it online. Uh, to adapt the, the, the and, and kind of, you know, it's sort of the adaptive reuse of, of existing housing stock to upgrade to, uh, to low carbon uh, performance levels. Um, and then another one uh, uh, introduced by Ilhan Omar from Minnesota um, for, that proposes that the construction of 10 million new units of public housing, real public housing, not affordable housing, that is still built by nonprofit developers, but public housing built in a manner comparable to the way those dams and the public schools and the other buildings that I showed you the hospitals uh, were, uh, were built. Um, so, so that's, uh, that, those are exam the, uh, policy proposals that you can look towards and just think, okay, ask, what would be the architecture of those proposals that, that, would, that would, in a sense, follow from these kinds of proposals? Uh, and and you, can, you can come up with your own, uh, uh, so there are many other, uh, you know, political uh, sort of initiatives and proposals from um, formal uh, uh, political actors, but also from uh, from uh, more uh, locally based um, groups that, that one way or another, um, you could simply ask, okay, what would be the architecture uh, that accompanies this or that, shall we say, sort of pro progressive initiative uh, to think and work um, to, to decarbonize uh, uh, in, a, in an equitable manner. Um, okay. Um, I think, uh, well, I still have, uh, there's still other questions. Um, <clears throat> uh, well, a practical question, Jackie's asking that the links within the page to power, okay. I, I fixed, think I fixed, fixed that. the okay. links, Reinhold, if you want to just take Kadia's question. Uh, the I will. Okay, that's the, let's take Thanks. that as the last question. Okay, so Kadia's question is going to be the last one. Um, but the links are fixed and they, they now link to some of the things I'm, I'm referring to. I should all, we, at the Buell Center, you just look, go through the power site. We, we've tried to, in a sense, portray the dramas of, Amer of mostly American life, but this is an international drama uh, related to especially frontline life uh, in the climate crisis um, uh, in order to pose these kinds of questions, that the same kind of questions that you're asking um, to, uh, in, a, in a more focused and specific way. So you can go to those links for that. Okay, quickly, uh, uh, Kadija, Kadija. Um, the Green New Deal requires regional solutions, as they say, as part of the overall plan to slow the negative effects of climate change. However, as, you, as I just explained, regions have different definitions of what justice, justice and equity look like. What are some examples of how radical public works projects have been successfully implemented in regions that don't support them uh, uh, or support their prerequisites? 
Well, that's a, that's a great, that's a good question. Um, you know, um, I don't want to, um, I appreciate that, you know, what I'm basically saying, and as you picked up on, that you see actually this regionalist language, even in the Green New Deal resolution, it's, it's already, it's there as you, as you picked up. Um, and so it, 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 we might be tempted, you know, whether we are urban planners or, or urban designers or architects or, uh, or policymakers um, or, or simply citizens to, to opt for and, and advocate for, like as the GND says, regional solutions, a new kind of regionalism. The reason I call this dialectical regionalism is, is that, that, you know, that may not be the, the worst idea. I mean, if you think about how to democratize the U.S. energy grid, uh, to, to move uh, the, the whole, the national grid in, off of uh, oil and coal and onto clean energy, uh, regional strategies may, may work best because the grid is basically a, a patchwork. However, um, as you point out, uh, and as I also explained, uh, you're likely to encounter uh, certain conflicts and, and, and even contradictions in such processes. Um, and so you're asking whether there are examples of radical public works projects that have successfully overcome these kinds of things. And I, you know, I must say, I don't think the projects even have to be so radical. I mean, it's interesting to think about what from the New Deal is uncontroversial versus what's controversial. Even the TVA is not so controversial. You know, at this point, we should all be embarrassed by those restrooms. We should also, we should be ashamed that architects designed those restrooms. Uh, and, and so, but we, you know, we should also know that, that the, um, that, 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 that our society, the, the sort of enlightened, um, critical discourse to which we at least theoretically aspire in, in the university and well beyond uh, would not tolerate uh, uh, the, the, this, this kind of segregated uh, kind of space. So, okay, so, so that means that, you know, if you were to build a dam like those today, that you're not gonna have separate but equal, quote unquote, you know, restrooms, but there are gonna be other kinds of inequities. And so that's what we need to train ourselves to do. These things don't go away because we're living in, and working in a society that is built around them. And that's kind of the, really the point of, of, of progressive initiatives, especially uh, more ambitious ones like the GND in its most, you could say radical forms as, as in, to use your language. Uh, but, you know, decidedly less radical programs like social security are, also uh, very successfully um, still with us uh, uh, from the New Deal uh, era, uh, as are the many public schools. Now the public schools were, were, not, uh, the, the, were not initiated or kind of, you know, did not, did not originate with the, with the New Deal. Uh, but as I showed you, many were built, public hospitals, right? I mean, these, these should not be controversial uh, projects uh, to, to propose a new public hospital. Imagine today, wouldn't it be, what, what an idea. You, you saw the tragic scenes uh, of Elmhurst Hospital uh, in Queens. It, it was, I'll tell you a personal story, it was the first project that I worked on as an architect working in an office here in New York in, in, in the 1980s, I date myself, um, of the renovations of Elmhurst Hospital. Uh, so I know it uh, quite well. Um, and it was a real, so it's a real tragedy to see this, 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 this system, this hospital and many others overwhelmed. Uh, well, why? There are many reasons, but, but one has to do with basically the neoliberalization of the health system and, and the, the, the sort of, for the, the sort of defunding of, of public institutions like public hospitals, public schools and so on, were forced to, to, uh, to operate on, 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 on very, very razor thin budgets. Uh, and the encouragement, the, the, in the basically the subsidizing of for-profit healthcare and for-profit education. Uh, so, and many other, of course, in many other areas, you can say the same for housing, right? With, with, the, with, 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 with uh, you know, tax credits for, for mortgages, uh, even at the same time that public housing is defunded. So, so these are, you know, there are, there are typically positive examples on either side of these equations, but they're, they're always gonna have, as public housing does in its own way, uh, contradictions and, and conflicts uh, built into them. 
So I encourage you, all of you, and thank you uh, all for, for your patience and for listening for your, your, your amazing questions, uh, to continue thinking about, um, about these matters. Just ask yourself the same kinds of questions about in the, in the work that you do in school and beyond, um, uh, about what could be public uh, about your work. Uh, and so I also want to thank Lila and the whole uh, team at GSAP Events uh, for, uh, for making all of this possible. <laughs> and, and I hope that, uh, that, that all of you have, uh, have found our discussion uh, stimulating and, as we say, uh, and, uh, and perhaps even uh, energizing. Thank you. <laughs>